hour seminar featuring Faith Kearns. Um, first, I want before I introduce Faith, I wanted to thank Southern Illinois University in particular, uh, Gary Kinsel, our Vice Chancellor for Research, for co-sponsoring this seminar. Uh, also, many thanks to Elaine Grinder, who's on here, who did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the organizing and marketing of the seminar. Um, we're excited today to have Dr. Faith Kearns from the University of California, one of the leading thinkers and practitioners on science communication in the US to speak to us today. Faith coordinates research and outreach programs for the California Institute of Water Resources. Her research interests lie at the intersection of science communication, community engagement, and relationship building, particularly as these topics relate to the environment and water resources. She previously served as officer with the Science Division of the Environment Program at the Pew Charitable Trust, where she collaborated with policy and advocacy staff to develop research projects and integrate scientific information into campaigns. Faith has also managed a wildfire research and outreach center at the University of California, Berkeley, served as a AAAS Science and Policy Fellow at the U.S. Department of State and developed science communication projects at the Ecological Society of America. So she's, she's done a lot. She received a PhD degree in freshwater ecology and policy from Berkeley and a BS in environmental science from Northern Arizona University. And we're really excited to, to have Faith today uh, we will be having a Q&A session immediately following your talk. Um, we will have a hard stop at one o'clock so people can, can go about their day. But to participate in that Q&A, you can either put your questions in the chat, which we'll be monitoring here, uh, the UCOWER staff will monitor, or you can raise your virtual hand in Zoom. So, and Faith can uh, call on you that way. So, um, she also, Faith, has recently published the book, Getting to the Heart of Science Communication, A Guide to Effective Management. Um, and she will actually be presenting a workshop at our upcoming UCOWER conference in uh, June 14th through the 16th in Greenville, South Carolina. So if you want to hear more, tune in uh, to our UCOWER conference in Greenville. So take it away, Faith. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, everybody can see that, all right. Are we okay? Um, so, all right. Uh, so, as Carl said, um, I'm Faith Kearns, a scientist, a science communication practitioner with the California Institute for Water Resources, um, which is located in the University of California's Division of Ag and Natural Resources, which is our cooperative right. extension. I just, I can't see what's happening. Oh, I might need people to mute themselves. Um, so I want to thank um, especially Carl and Elaine for inviting me uh, to talk with you guys today. And then also to those of you who are listening and engaging with this material. I know it's a challenging and busy time for everyone. And we're all sort of Zoom tired at this point. So I do really, really appreciate the engagement. So um, today I want to talk about uh, science communication. That was I. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you just dropped out for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're having some weather, so hopefully we are right. So, um, so today I want to talk about science communication in sort of a different way than probably what most people are used to, the way that's been talked about it for most of my career, um, which as Carl said, I've I've spent I've actually been doing communications for longer than I've been a scientist. And I've been doing science communication since it was before since before it was really called science communication. And so although I'm also a scientist, I really am coming at this particular issue as a practitioner of science communication for the last 25 or 30 years, depending on how you want to count it. And um, I've practiced in, in a wide variety of sectors and worked primarily on the issues of water, wildfire, and climate change, although um, I've also worked on all sorts of things like fisheries and things like that. Um, 
So to give a little context for the ideas that I want to talk about, um, I'm going to share a brief story. So as, about 15 years ago, um, I was a scientist who was not super long out of graduate school when I had this career and sort of really life altering experience talking with a man who was um, a bit teary at a community workshop. Uh, at the time, I was working in this wildfire research center at Berkeley, and my colleagues and I were in this um, small Northern California town for a fire safety demonstration day at a fairgrounds. Um, and we had just presented information uh, from our research about what homeowners could do to prevent home loss uh, during wildfires. So at the time, this was fairly cutting edge research, um, basically indicating that houses could be built to withstand wildfire from a science perspective. Um, it, you know, this was a pretty cut and dried issue. We had a lot of great research and we were, you know, doing we had some really nice tools to make the work accessible. We were talking with local firefighters and communities, um, state agencies, the legislature and beyond uh, to figure out how to implement some of this work. In other words, we were sort of doing everything we thought we needed to do to be good community engaged researchers. Um, and we also talked a little bit about this controversial idea of a stay or go policy that we were writing a peer reviewed paper about. Uh, this kind of policy is pretty common in Australia, uh, which has a very different firefighting system than we have in the US. Um, and there, uh, instead of being evacuated, families can choose to be trained and stay to protect their homes during wildfires. Um, since while since firefighters may not always have the resources to protect each and in every individual property, as you can imagine, this idea of sort of staying with your house as a wildfire rages through can raise a lot of literal life and death feelings for people. Um, it can also raise some intrigue, right? People are very interested in fire. Um, and, and again, from a research perspective, this is a somewhat common sense idea. Um, but in a story that will sound familiar at this point, although it was not at the time, this was uh, later in the fall of, of uh, 2008, but earlier that summer, two large wildfires um, burning near, one burning down near Big Sur on the central coast uh, had, had burned a lot of acres. Um, and then uh, around a few days later, an 18 wildfire complex started in Mendocino County up here in the north. Um, and both sets of wildfires threatened homes, uh, communities were evacuated, and firefighting resources were very strained. Um, as an additional 30 wildfires were also burning in other places around the state. Again, this might sound for, more familiar now, but it, it wasn't at the time. And people were very, very emotional about the situation. Um, so here we were, we were talking to people who had just lived the dilemmas of our research topic, right? So some were sad, angry, afraid, anxious about having um, had to evacuate. Others were just grateful that their property damage had not been worse. Um, and so this man I was talking with shared with me how powerless he felt having to leave um, his house after many exhausting hours spent sort of moving equipment and farm animals. And he was really unsure that staying would have helped much. Um, but just listening to his to our presentation had re-triggered his trauma from the fire. Something that despite, you know, my own experiences with trauma, I'd really never even thought of as we went into that event. And re remember, this was around 2007, 2008, and words like trauma were not particularly um, well utilized and definitely not in the context of the sciences. So this is me putting a narrative on it um, at this point. So it was listening and, and really, truly listening to uh, his story was the first time I, I really became and felt sort of in an embodied way that uh, my scientific training just didn't prepare me for the really strong emotions that uh, come with this kind of research that has immediate um, meaning in people's lives. And I'm so grateful to him um, because talking with him inspired uh, more than a decade of work at this point to um, understand how science um, and emotion can be integrated because I really ended up feeling like our lack of attention to the feelings of the people in the room that day were detrimental to them and to us and ultimately to our work. I'm not sure there's some background uh, folks could double check that they're muted. Um, so anyway, that led me to, to really focus on this idea of science communication within emotional and contentious environments. So at this point, I just want to give an overview of the talk so you know where we're headed. Um, my main thesis is just that relating is a really key part of the communication challenge that has been 
largely overlooked in science, scientific and technical communication efforts, um, including around water. <laughs> and um, everything I'll be talking about is covered in my book, as Carl said, getting to the heart of science communication, but I'll only be able to talk about a small subset of what's included there. Um, so uh, I'll talk very specifically about the evolving practice um, of science communication, uh, some of my ideas about how we can refocus, and then briefly discuss a core set of tools, which are relating, listening, working with conflict and understanding trauma and healing. Um, and I, I just wanna express gratitude uh, to everyone who spoke with me for the book, which was dozens and dozens of people. Um, and, and I am just so grateful for them. And uh, so I'm gonna share their words and uh, Twitter handles with you um, as appropriate now. So just for some context, um, what is science communication? So I often find that a lot of the disagreements over what science communication is come down to the fact that we all have different ideas about, about what we're talking about. So I just want to start by saying, you know, for me, when I talk about science communication, I'm talking about communicating science with non-experts. But the really, really big caveat that I like to add is to say that that is most of us most of the time, right? So um, I'm trained as an ecologist. Uh, as recent events have made clear, I am not an epidemiologist. So I feel like that should sort of give us some um, compassion and insight in terms of being the recipients of a lot of science communication material ourselves. So um, science, scientific and technical communication definitely has a long global history. There are people doing some really interesting work on that. Um, I cite some of those in my book, uh, but I really want to focus on what I know, which is just the sort of last 25 to 35 years in North America. America, particularly in the United States. Um, and so what we have done here really has, has been to focus on this idea of performance, right? So giving a good talk and that kind of thing. Um, and then and paired that with filling an information gap. Uh, the idea that if people just had more information, they do X, Y, or Z. Um, and this was often done by connecting elite experts at elite institutions with elite journalists and decision makers also at elite institutions. Um, but what I try to argue in my book is that a more ground level science communication practice has existed at the same time, but for reasons that I won't go into right now, it really has sort of taken a backseat to these more very, what I would consider um, elitist and top-down approaches. So um, the stage, the sage on the stage model has proliferated. And um, you know, while, while we've found that information is of course important, um, I really wanna stress that information is is important, facts are important, that's not what I'm saying. Um, on its own, information doesn't you know, really offer much of a theory of change. And I certainly recognize the irony that I am performing that role right now. It's very difficult to get around, right? Um, and there is a time and a place for it, but it can't be all that we're doing because in reality, uh, people communicate with each other in really complex ways, configurations, and places. So even the newly favored term sort of uh, two-way communication doesn't quite fit. Um, it's more like we're in this vast uh, communication ecosystem with um, many varied conversations and connections. And I think we all know this um, on some level, and yet many times our communication efforts don't really reflect that understanding. And that is truly because it is actually very difficult uh, and time-consuming to do in a different way. Um, and I definitely empathize with that. But I think we're still, we are starting to see a real shift toward what I call relational or you might call community engaged communication models, um, which are much more about the, the sort of people we are in relationship with um, and the communities that they are and we are a part of, right? And that kind of work is just a uh, presents a fundamentally different prospect in terms of the skills needed and things like that. So in addition, another thing that I have seen change vastly in my career is that the people doing science communication work has changed. And I really tried in the book to center this idea of sort of starting with the people doing the work. And I think a very different picture of what science communication is emerged from taking that approach. So long considered the domain of tenured faculty, science communicators are increasingly in precarious positions. They are interested in and often a part of various communities that have previously been marginalized within the sciences, whether that's by gender, sexuality, age, um, 
neurodiversity, all, all sorts of things, right? And, and this diverse group is also changing science communication practice, including by challenging notions of objectivity and advocacy in science. So for example, Sadaka Hanamoku, a doctoral candidate um, at UC Berkeley, who is native Hawaiian, was writing about the 30 meter telescope and said, to me, this debate is not about science versus culture. In my practice of science, the two are inextricably linked. I'm Kanaka Aoi and I do science because I'm Hawaiian. I research out of Aloha, Aloha you know, a deep familial love for the land. Um, in addition, I'd say many of these science communicators are uh, much less interested <laughs> in relying on the idea of sort of scientific authority and intellectual distance as tools. They are said, instead very interested in connection and consent. So Sarah Myrie, a climate and environmental scientist um, in Washington state, for example, told me, the paradigm of science communication has largely been about the appropriate presentation of scientific authority, which is about divesting from your own mortal and emotional and human connections. You are forced to perform respectability, to posture, and when you try to critique that posture or even just do things differently, you become the problem instead of the thing that's actually a problem. And here, Sarah is sort of hearkening to words by the feminist scholar, Sarah Ahmed. Um, indeed, the, the questions, um, approaches, and outcomes that these science communicators are seeking are, are really quite different from uh, the folks who came before us. Um, many people live and work in the in the same communities um, as, as the people that they work with, which again, I think is, a, is just a fundamentally different proposition than science and communication that sort of take, takes place outside of any direct ties to a community. Um, Mila Marshall, who's a doctoral student at the University of Illinois, for example, told me that emotional intelligence and cultural understanding are key in a lot of these issues. So um, Neela said to me uh, about, she was talking about misinformation in this context and said, you know, these are deep issues. People are sometimes relying on misinformation. When you're talking about difficult subjects, you have to understand you're asking people to acknowledge there's a chance something they believe to be true, told to them by people they love and respect is wrong. We can provide accurate information, but there also has to be somebody standing in the gap, prepared to support them through their emotions around how it feels to be corrected and the embarrassment of going hard for what you thought was the truth. Um, this is a really profound statement, and I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in how taking uh, what Mila is saying um, seriously would really fundamentally, again, alter the way we think of what science communication practice is. Um, finally, uh, I spent a whole chapter of the book discussing science communication careers because I feel we're at a real turning point. Um, at this stage, most people with particularly doctoral level scientific training will end up outside of academia versus within it. Um, and certainly the interest in science communication careers, um, either as a whole career or certainly as a big part of any career outside of academia um, is, is definitely increasing. Um, at the same time, the, the path to science communication training, uh, much less an actual career, um, is not legible to most students. So for example, Julian Reyes, who is now the um, USDA Climate Hubs National Coordinator told me, I would have liked to have more science communication as an explicit part of my training. I think graduate students are navigating the field in a piecemeal fashion that is too dependent on circumstances and a sympathetic advisor. It's not particularly equitable. Um, and Priya Shukla, um, you know, it, who's a doctoral student at UC Berkeley, uh, told me that she had been interested in, you know, having a science communication actual practice-based practice experience as part of her graduates, graduate training, not just, you know, a course alone, but really an immersive practice-based experience. And she was lucky enough to be part of a program, uh, an NSF uh, program that allowed her to spend a summer working for a science communication group, Compass. Um, and, and now, that she has had that experience, she says um, it really changed her views on uh, science policy and communication significantly, saying, I'm back from having dipped my toes in the policy pool. And then I hear the kind of advice that academics who haven't done any policy work themselves give to students, and I am able to reflect on it more deeply, she says very generously. Um, I now feel uh, much better equipped to start to think about those specific implications of my research. Um, I couldn't have learned that 
lot by sitting at my computer looking at models. So the last thing I'll say on the career front um, is if you think it's tough for early career folks, uh, try being a mid-career science communicator. Um, unfortunately, uh, many science communicators are undervalued, um, underpaid, and underprotected. <laughs> So, um, and part of that is because uh, the issues that science communicators working on these days um, are, are often fairly emotional and contentious topics. So we've got the, the kind of things I work on, water, drought, wildfire, climate change. Um, and I think of course the issue that has made the complexity of science communication um, legible to many more people and, and that is COVID, right? So um, it used to be in fact, pretty hard for me to explain sometimes why I was uh, focusing on this kind of approach. Um, and, and yet I think COVID has made it very clear to people if it wasn't before how um, deeply political and cultural science really is. Um, as many as of us have long argued, you know, science does not exist in a vacuum um, and, and neither does communicating it. And so I think we need to act accordingly. So what does this, this really look like on the ground? Um, at this point, I, I wanna give a couple of concrete water examples of how emotions and conflict kind of can show up. So for example, Sarah Wolf, um, who is at the University of Waterloo was talking about drinking, um, tr the, trying to get people to be okay about drinking recycled water, right? And so she, she said, human emotions are complicated. So talking about them is never easy. But given the many and multiplying stresses on our drinking water systems, it's time to stop ignoring how powerful and universal emotions such as disgust both help and hinder our water decisions. So she's basically saying that, you know, we can have all the technical information we want about how it's fine to drink recycled water, but if people are grossed out by it, we have to actually take that issue seriously. Um, Parisa Parsifar, who's now a AAAS science uh, policy fellow, um, also uh, did her did her doctoral research um, on drinking water issues. And here she's talking about children saying early experiences of disgust and fear are linked to water contamination beliefs and water consumption behaviors among children. Although these might seem like individual issues, fear and disgust can have far reaching consequences. So here she's talking about say the effects of children being grossed out by their drinking water uh, leading to to dehydration in schools and things like that. Um, and again, these issues I think are even more amplified when you live in the community where you work, face the same issues, um, see the same people at the grocery store, right? So it becomes much more of an issue of accountability. So Sarah Watson, um, who works with Sea Grant, for example, had told me um, about her work on sea level rise that uh, I recently gave several presentations on the local effects of sea level rise to groups like homeowners associations. Each time, at least half the people there were completely freaked out. I now get nervous having to say out loud what these climate projections tell us about tidal flooding in the region. It's hard information for communities to hear for what is often the first time. And it's hard for me to give the same bad news over and over again. News I increasingly worry isn't bad enough to cover where we're headed, but that I simultaneously worry sounds too alarmist for what people are ready to hear, right? So um, lest we fall into the, the pit of despair, um, of course, these are very challenging um, issues and situations, but I think there can also be joy to, found, to be found in some of these science communication efforts. So um, Malika Noko, uh, my good colleague who I host the Water Talk podcast with, um, told me about creating something called Plant Love Stories with some of her colleagues, which she says we created because we wanted to focus more on plant appreciation than science and just make it fun. It makes me feel joyful and light. It makes me feel like I can be funny. I have all these parts of my personality. I feel like I have to suppress for science, but with this, I can be goofy and make puns and be a total plant nerd and it's okay. So with that background, um, I will jump into the tools section. Uh, so uh, right off the bat, I will say, you know, relating is, is the first tool that I talk about in this section of the book, uh, where again, I posit this idea that, that we feel it really face sort of more of a relationship challenge than a, than a 
communication challenge. Um, a communication is part of the relationship challenge, right? So um, the overall idea is that this is sort of more about how we relate to each other as equals, um, rather than, for example, pushing behavior change onto others because we, right, the, the objective experts know best. Um, and this is a this is can be a, a hard pill to swallow and a difficult difficult thing um, to wrap minds around. So I'm happy to talk more about it. But the basic idea is that relating invites a very different skill set uh, than the normal sort of uh, way we talk about science communication, uh, where we're you know very much focused on the communicator and how to talk better and how to message better and frame better. Um, but instead, uh, we're thinking about including uh, developing the ability to listen deeply rather than speak perfectly. And particularly working with the emotions and conflict, uh, particularly internal conflict that can come up when we are listening well to other people. So I want to note that relational work is present in many cultures, spiritual traditions, um, and, and many, many uh, different strains of scholarship. So, for example, in addition to Black feminist scholarship, uh, people like Bell Hooks and many others, uh, many Indigenous scholarship scholars ranging from sort of Kim Tallbear to Zoe Todd Wright um, work talk about relationality. Melanie Yahtzee, who is at the University of New Mexico, for example, um, I interviewed her about uh, the Water is Life movement. And she says, you know, I, I noticed with Water is Life, the word life in particular is was about countering the politics and reality of death that resource extraction has brought to Native communities, including my own. I call these relations of extraction one-way relationships where resources are extracted from native lands with no benefit to native peoples. Melanie is Navajo. Um, that leads us into this radical politics of relationality based on indigenous understanding of kinship, of relatives, of being in good relations of reciprocity. It's about mutual respect and simply being a good relative. Um, in addition to, the, to those sort of, um, there's pretty extensive deep field about, about, about relationality. Um, and then on the professional side, uh, there are also many professions that, that have um, relational methods pretty integrated into their training. So that includes law, medicine, psychotherapy, um, many others have developed relationship-centered approaches, which I'm very grateful for because it means that we do not need to reinvent the wheel, right? So Theopia Jackson, who is someone I very much look up to, a clinical psychologist uh, who also teaches with Saybrook University, um, told me when she thinks about working relationally, right? She says, I can think of my practice as a service model where I frame my efforts around being in service of others, that means I cannot come at it from a place of being an expert with all the answers. Again, I think this very much goes against um, the way that we are often trained to use the, the, the authority of science in our science communication efforts. She's approaching her practice very differently. And she says, instead, maybe I can come at it from a place of asking, what do you need? Here's what I can offer. Is this helpful? If so, how do I make it accessible to you? If not, what do you need that I might be able to provide? Those are guiding questions for working relationally. And so um, I, I try to take uh, Dr. Jackson's words very seriously. So again, I wanna give uh, some examples of um, what this work looks like in a really concrete way. So one story I can tell comes from my colleagues at um, the University of California Cooperative Extension System. So during our last long drought, which might be the same drought that we're still in, um, uh, small Hmong farmers on leased land uh, in California's Central Valley um, experienced a pretty widespread mental health crisis spurred on by low water allocations, right? These are folks that are working um, uh, on land that they do not own. And so water is very easily uh, taken away from them. And so um, uh, my colleagues asked what they could do. Uh, and this is a really important part, right? It wasn't work they would have done initially, right? They, they, they changed their approach because it was what was needed. So um, for example, my colleague, Ruth uh, Dahlquist-Willard is um, a, uh, an entomologist by training, but she says, you know, we, we held multilingual workshops to inform the growers of a state grant process to help with energy efficiency on water pumps and get them started on their applications, then offered one-on-one -on -one assistance for completing the application and getting all the required documents together. Um, and with that effort, growers were able to save up to 65% on water and electricity bills with their new equipment 
And Michael Yang, who's Hmong himself and works with Ruth, um, said, you know, especially for Hmong farmers, water is crucial to grow crops like lemongrass, lemongrass, loofah, long beans, and sugar cane. It was wonderful to see crops grow lush and green because we had water. Um, another example comes from some colleagues of mine in Southern California who developed a project trying to gain a better understanding of um, how people use their, how communities use their water uh, in an effort to help water agencies better serve people. So instead of assuming they knew best, they developed this approach that centered not just um, communities' needs, but also, also their strengths. So Mike Antos basically said, you know, this, we, we framed this project as a strengths and needs assessment to overcome the deficit model of thinking, and we centered listening as a key process. It's important to elevate community expertise to be on par with agency expertise. We have to get past the we know what they need mode of resource management. Um, Emily Brooks, who works with the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, basically uh, said, you know, the idea with the project was that locals are the best experts on their own community's needs and strengths. They live in and move through these places every day and have experience and knowledge that isn't accessible to outside experts like water planners. Um, an important goal of the project was to find out how water agencies could best support people they didn't often hear from, which includes the homeless and renters, because so much agency outreach is to homeowners, right? This is a, a fairly large problem, um, is to reach people who are not just homeowners. Um, and, and in the end, Valerie Olson, an anthropologist at UC Irvine, um, shared the results of the project saying just, just these are just a couple of the things that they found, but obviously they found the community was far from monolithic, um, doesn't experience water in the same way, and therefore agencies need more specific interventions. She said that, you know, for example, while managers and communities might have a common goal of safe drinking water, managers rely on tests that tell them the water is safe, while communities rely on taste or smell, which can lead to a disconnect, right? And, and um, this is a big focus these days is on this sort of idea of trust um, and how we think about trust in, in our water, right? And if we have totally different measurements and ways that we're looking at things um, that, that can uh, lead to an ongoing issue. Um, they also found that language posed a barrier, the agency had on-call translation services, but it turned out they were burdensome for users. So this listening project surfaced the idea that a new approach such as hiring multilingual staff should really be a priority. Um, and while listening is this very beautiful practice, I think it's um, really important to recognize the ethical challenges of what can be a very extractive process. So Yana Lambrinadu, who's an anthropologist at Smith College, um, who has done a lot of work with sort of lead and water issues and is the only person I know who teaches um, listening at a uh, undergraduate level to engineers, um, uh, basically told me, you know, listening is often diluted to become about empathy and compassion when we're talking about justice and accountability. How scientists and engineers listen is inseparable from questions of power because it can be done in ways that bolster community knowledge and strengthen scientific understanding of real world problems. But it can also be done in ways that overlook or distort community knowledge and compromise scientists' ability to help people in ways that are scientifically sound and, ex and experienced as desirable and just. Um, this is another point, particularly as we shift uh, to think about listening, is to think about how to really uh, think about some of the extraction um, issues that might come up and the power imbalances involved. So, um, the third tool that I delve into in the book is uh, getting more comfortable with conflict. <laughs> so this is often a hot button issue for a lot of people uh, when it when it comes to conflict. Um, it's really challenging because some people are really conflict averse, right? And other people absolutely love conflict. Um, and I think it's really valuable to kind of see that those are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, they both give conflict a lot of power, right? If you love it or hate it, it's, you know, it's something that you're giving a lot of power to. To. And what I'm trying to argue for in the book is really a more middle path of sort of increasing comfort with conflict. Um, and I and I also want to note that this doesn't apply equally. This is obviously um, a really hard time to think about conflict within our culture. Um, 
But I think the idea is that if you're, you know, someone who avoids conflict um, and has a relative amount of power, you might want to try exercising your conflict muscle a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's it's a really conf- uh, complex topic. But um, one of the things that we tend to do in the sciences is treat conflict as something that can be defeated with information, which I think if you think about any of your personal conflicts in your life, it just it's it's really not how conflict works, right? So um, I will share just a brief anecdote, which is one of my my favorite experiences was watching a colleague go from very conflict avoidant to realizing he needed ethically to be okay with it. Um, As I was talking about some of what I'm talking about with you, uh, my cooperative extension colleague, Mark Thorne, sort of went from feeling like climate change wasn't a topic he could broach with the often conservative ranchers he works with to feeling like he really actually had an obligation to. And he he told me, you know, the consequence of avoiding talking about the effects of climate change on ag production has too many negative consequences for the people I work with and for food security in general. I now see it as a professional and ethical obligation to talk about what can be difficult topics, and I have to trust that the long-term working relationships I have are strong enough to handle it, which is, you know, why I started with with thinking about relating is that hopefully within that relational context, um, many more kinds of conversations become possible. Um, And then I think it's, you know, again, very hard to talk about conflict without talking about power, another issue that we tend to really shy away from in the sciences. Um, But Linda Mendez, who is now at the University of Denver, uh, focuses quite a bit on water and power issues. um, And So she said, you know, I I think focusing on better communication is distracting. There are these much larger issues of power at stake, and it's convenient to have a lot of very smart people worrying instead about communication. There's definitely some truth to the idea of intentionally letting people fight over the discourse instead of the essence of important policies and processes. Um, Always something to try to keep in mind. So Uh, Finally, on the the issue of power, I will say, you know, speaking truth to power comes with its own challenges. Uh, Sarika Kolis Suzuki was just finishing up her master's degree at the University of British Columbia um, when she was asked to present the results of her work on international fisheries management at a UN meeting in New York. And little had, had prepared her for the kinds of questions that she received at what she assumed uh, to be a scientific presentation that instead carried a lot of political meaning. Um, She did, in fact, speak truth to power and was challenged by uh, diplomats who were angry about her research results. And even today, which is a dozen years later, um, she still puzzles over how she might have handled it differently. And she told me, you know, this it was a formative time for me as a scientist because it was the first time I faced industry. All my experience had been in academic situations, and I wasn't fully prepared in terms of understanding who I'd be talking to. On the one hand, it's always important to know your audience, but at the same time, and I go back and forth with this, had I understood who the audience was, I would have used different language, and that would have changed what I said, which I'm not sure would have been the right thing either. You know, some of these are the kinds of professional dilemmas that are very, very difficult to find a sort of right answer for, right? And then finally, I will just touch on one more tool, which is understanding trauma, uh, which these days is fairly widespread um, and has really big impacts for for thinking about how we communicate scientific issues that, again, have this very direct meaning um, in people's lives and particularly where trauma is involved in an obvious way. So Tessa Hill, who is a professor at UC Davis, um, also lives in Sonoma County and was affected by the Tubbs fire in 2017, you know, saying we awoke to multiple friends asking us if we were evacuating. We launched ourselves out of bed, turned on the TV and pulled up social media feeds and began a frantic hour of messaging friends and family, trying to understand the wildfire chaos around us. By daylight, we noticed Some of the ash was as big as our hands and had legible writing on it. Other large pieces falling into our yard were burned fabric. The remnants of our community were falling from the sky. That fire erased our sense of safety, not just at the individual level, but across our county. It was a community scale trauma. And I think that... 
If, if folks could mute, please. Um, so I think, you know, while it's it's valuable to understand that that trauma can be a part of this work, um, it's also incredibly important to be culturally responsible and thinking about um, trauma because not everyone experiences it the same and, and not everyone accepts that label, right? So again, Dr. Jackson um, told me, you know, part of the challenge with the trauma bucket is that it's become this catch-all phrase that means different things to different people. Um, those of you who follow any trauma work We'll know it's it's uh, it's being debated <laughs> as we speak uh, uh, where we are thinking about trauma. Um, and she says it's important not to position people who are dealing with significant issues as having something less about them. Some folks are quite adept and functional despite the context they live in. Their world is already much more in perspective. Um, and. One, one caveat that, again, I like to add here is to say that in addition to thinking about how trauma affects other people, I think we have to also consider how it affects those of us who sort of work on, communicate about these issues year after year, um, and often these days are experiencing the trauma and communicating about it, uh, speaking as someone who works on fire and drought issues in California and lives in California. Um, understanding the way it affects us and other people and the combination, I think, is a, is a very important important and underexplored issue. So for example, um, you know, if, if you're a therapist, you definitely want to think about how other people's trauma affects your own understanding of their trauma, right? So um, again, Dr. Jackson says, I might be a therapist working with you, but I want to be curious about my own trauma history. My work with you around your trauma exposes me to a certain level of trauma. It can inadvertently add to me feeling bad for you versus empathizing with you. Um, and the, again, this is a very, very key point. Like, I, I'm so grateful to, to folks who shared so much wisdom with me. But she said, you know, sometimes people who are helping are helping out of their own desire to help someone, as opposed to seeing what that person needs. Then they get their feelings hurt when someone doesn't accept the beautiful thing brought to them. These are the kinds of things that can come up if professionals aren't aware of their own trauma. So um, at this point, I'm going to, to shift into sort of these ideas of moving forward in science communication at this point. So one of the big challenges of science communication training over the last few decades is that really tended to treat all communicators as if they were the same, offering a generic set of tools assumed to work for everyone. Um, and sort of going back to my earlier points, this is just not the case. Uh, science communicators are now a very diverse group of, of people working with very diverse communities. And again, this just fundamentally changes the practice. So Sergio Avila, who works with the Sierra Club in Southern Arizona, told me about working with ranchers in the borderlands between Mexico and Arizona, and how he really had to shift how he thought about this work, saying, um, too often scientists create language that is actually meant to exclude people. We build ourselves up as the experts, and then we're supposed to dumb down or simplify our language, which just leads to more feelings of superiority. Um, and again, I think that's a, a really profound point to think about is, is um, how the language that we use just on its own can be excluding, right? Um, and then finally, just, you know, given that this work is so difficult these days, I think it's important important to talk about self-care, um, but rather than approaching it from a sort of individualistic uh, a point of view, I really wanted to highlight folks who are sort of integrating their self and community care work. So Lydia Jennings, who, uh, who is a postdoc at the University of Arizona, um, is someone that I turn to a lot to try to think about how to stay grounded. Um, so she is a soil scientist studying mining remediation, but she's also a trail runner who is really excited about all things outdoors. And she's really managed to um, uh, meld herself into a trifecta she describes as an indigenous trail running scientist uh, that allows to, her to combine her love of science and nature with um, supporting other uh, indigenous communities and scholars. And she says, you know, I love to be outside. I love learning more about the world every day. And I'm also committed to being an active part of a more just future. For me, science is about service, particularly for marginalized communities. And that kind of service is an incredible responsibility that requires a lot of patience and commitment. Um, so, you know, what I've described here really is just the tip of, of a very large 
iceberg when it comes to the changes that we're seeing in science communication. And so the question, you know, I would I would leave you with really is, you know, what what more is possible? What more is possible when we imagine water or um, any kind of science communication and engagement as more relational and just? And, um, you know, with that, I will uh, stop and leave you with information about how to keep in touch and how to order the book. Um, you can use the code heart directly with my publisher for 20% off, but it's also available available anywhere that you buy books. So, um, and feel free to reach out, out to me with um, any, you know, more specific questions that folks have about this work. Um, and so with that, I will say, you know, thank you so much for your attention. I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen and let uh, Carl take over. <laughs> thank you, Faith. We really appreciate your presentation. So this, we have time for questions. So if you have a question for Faith, uh, you can raise your hand, you can put that in the chat. And to get us warmed up, Faith, I have a question for you as, as folks are thinking about those. Um, given the importance of science communication, I think everybody certainly who tunes in here agrees how important it is. How can we elevate the stature of uh, science communication as a career. You, you talked about that earlier in your talk and are there strategies uh, that can, can help with that situation? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I didn't go into in the presentation, uh, because it does get a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's a really important part of things is what I, really what I argue for throughout the book is that um, because of the numbers of people that are um, it's, you know, on the order of 80%, right, of, of doctoral students who are not going to become sort of traditional academics. And any job, I mean, I shouldn't say any, but the vast majority of jobs that you do outside of academia are going to be have as a large component communication. Um, and so, you know, in taking from the conversations that I've had with many other professionals over time, I've come to see the models of sort of medical training and legal training as potential models for science communication training. In other words, I think that there should be a clinical or practicum based training track within doctoral programs, where instead of just, you know, as Julian um, said in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in my, uh, in the book, he basically was saying these, these, these effort, these science communication um, training things are not offered equitably. Like they really are so dependent on who your advisor is, the program you're in, et cetera, et cetera. And most people are exposed to in maybe a couple day workshop where they learn um, a very, easy uh, tool, right? So, um, so basically, I, I think at this point, we're really looking at something more like integrating um, a, a practice-based experience and a sort of year-long, maybe it's a certificate program, maybe it's a, you know, I don't, I can't prescribe what that looks like, but I just think that, you know, right now we're training people with a, essentially what you might call a research practicum, which doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to say, but that's what we're doing, right? We're giving people the opportunity to do research as part of their doctoral training program. What I'm saying is people need the experience of doing communication work, in addition to having some grounding in some actual theories and things like that, that aren't just these like one-off workshops. So it's a, it's a pretty large change. Um, and if anybody wants me to, wants to hire me to come uh, develop a, you know, science communication practicum program at their university, I'm more than happy to think about it. Cause I really think that that's, that's where things need to go next. I hope that yeah. answers the question you had. Carl. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, we're starting, they're starting to roll in here. Here's one from Crystal Powers from Nebraska. She asks, how can power dynamics within academia be better addressed? Science communicators are often BS or MS versus faculty with PhDs who are not always open to learning from the communication professionals. Yes, I, I experience that on a daily basis. So yeah, I mean, I, um, it's a tough, it's a tough nut to crack, right? So part of it is that I think continuing to just elevate that this is really complex and difficult work um, is, is part of the way. But at the same time, I think my experience of universities is they just are hierarchical entities. And that's to a certain degree going, I, I can't see overturning that per se, but I think finding yourself uh, in a situation where that's really what you're 
looking for um, is, is one way of handling things. But I also think continually trying to say, this is difficult work. Whenever I present this work to um, you know, small groups of say faculty and graduate students who are trying to do with the best of intention science communication work as part of their research project or a fellowship or whatever, they are they are often quite overwhelmed by the work that this takes really. And they, they want to do it in theory, but when they really start to understand the details, it's like, how am I gonna do this? And I'm like, right. <laughs> you know? And so I think, you know, again, sort of um, elevating the practitioner and the, the amount of work the practice takes is going to be going to be a huge part of it. And I will say that this, this issue of, um, folks with, you know, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees being the ones who are the communicators. In addition to, we are really starting to see um, what people might call a feminization of a field. So think about doctors and nurses or who, who te elementary school teachers are. This science communication work is at starting to enter that same realm where um, it is underpaid and undervalued and becoming women's work. And I say that say that broadly right um it's it's a complex it's a complex topic but something that we're seeing and so part of where i th i think we are, might be lucky is that we're seeing it knowing that that's happening in other fields um and and maybe there are some ways around it but i have not delved into what could be done to sort of prevent that but you see it in multiple multiple fields um psychology is another one a lot of practicing therapists are women and the sort of leaders of all the large organizations are men right white white men i mean race is also a huge a huge factor here not just gender so um yeah it's a it's a really challenging situation david hill from uh university of Leth lethbridge in in alberta canada asks he would be interested in your experience or learning about the difficulties of communicating science to elected officials at the local state slash provincial or national level. Yeah, thank you for that question, David. Um, I so it's very interesting to me. I I still go back to the to the idea that this relationship centered. Um, approach is what has been most effective for me um, at this point in my career. You know, I'm I'm uh, in my mid 40s and um, have been working at this for a long time and in in California for a lot of it. And you know, I, when I first started doing science policy work. Um, it felt very transactional, right? You're, you're just going in to sort of meet somebody and present your work. And instead, I think what's been more successful over time is actually developing these fairly um, lateral professional relationships with, with folks that are, um, are actually are the elected officials or appointed officials or things like that. And it's, it's very interesting to see that, that the way that that changes the the work itself. So, you know, I, I feel very familiar with the folks that um, do the policy work on the issues I work on in my state. Same with the journalists, um, just by being somebody who's been at this for a very long time and has focused on it as a relationship centered um, endeavor and not a transactional one. Thank you. Um, Dan Van Abs uh, has a question. He says, Science communication isn't just at the science public interface. The environmental and ecological sciences are becoming more collaborative and interdisciplinary. Is that forcing a breakdown in jargon-based communication to ensure that the experts talk to each other effectively? I don't know. I think anyone else's guess is as good as mine. I, I, you know, I see both happening. Like I. I consider myself an interdisciplinary scholar and interact with a lot of interdisciplinary scholars. And I think there's a real commitment to that kind of work and a real collegiality and understanding of, um, of needing to kind of move past our jargon and figure out what, what we're really working on. Um, so I, I definitely see strides in that arena um, much more so than I did early in my career. Um, and at the same time, I still see 
particularly this, this sense again of hierarchy uh, to be a real challenge. Like I, I have so many social scientists friends who still feel like they're the folks who get called on um, to be the communicators, even though they're, they're not communicators, they're researchers, right? And so that's where, you know, in my book, I was really trying to break down also this idea of a researcher versus a practitioner, um, because I think those are two very different things. And there are lots of people who are actually great hybrids and do research and practice together. Um, but, but the idea is, is basically to me that, um, you know, the, the, the hierarchy of, um, practice, research, and field specialty, so hard sciences, whatever you want to call, you know, that, that whole breakdown is actually a bigger barrier. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to folks feeling undervalued than the actual jargon issue to me. It's, it's again, more of a relationship issue and how we all kind of try to respect what everyone else brings to the table. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ryubu Lee at Southern Illinois University asks, how can we counteract with misinformation in science, which in many cases is designed to be relational to and targeting certain groups? Yeah, I mean, I will say I'm not, I am not a specialist in misinformation and disinformation at all. And there are folks who do specialize in that. And I would, you know, defer, defer to them. Um, and I, I do hear what you're saying in, in that the, the tactics, I guess, of, of thinking about misinformation are very relational and, and sort of hit at people's emotions and, and stir up conflict and all of those kinds of things. But I still, you know, just based on my own experiences working on things like climate change, um, I still feel like that's where the real um, change, I guess, is is more possible is in that level of, you know, being in a room with people and answering all their questions at a pretty micro scale about, say, what's happening with water in California and around climate change um, is, you know, the, the way the places that I find the most ability to really get into where people might be misinformed is in answering, you know, really personal questions about what's happening in their backyard and things like that. So I, I still, I don't think we can abandon the topics <laughs> or the, the strategies just because they're being misused as well. But again, like, I think there are people like Kate Starbird and many others who are sort of working on misinformation in a way that um, I would defer to. Dave Peralt from University of Lynchburg, he asked, how do we teach our students to become better science communicators when we are not great ones ourselves? Should we offer a unique class or incorporate it into more or incorporate it more into existing classes? Yeah, so again, I think this is, you know, it, it this is a, a big bone to pick in my book. Um, I, I empathize with folks who are in a position of sort of needing to, to try to train folks to do science communication, even though that's not their work. Um, and I would really strongly encourage people to find ways to um, have the people that do that work be involved in training. Uh, because I just, I, it's a specialized enough field at this point <laughs> that I just don't, that's where I think we need specialized training tracks for folks um, and need better ways of integrating practitioners into um, educational efforts. And it, it, it's very hard, right? Like I give so many talks uh, all over the country, especially right now virtually to undergraduates, graduates, where I'm the sort of guest speaker coming into their science class, you know, and maybe one or two students will follow up with me later, but the basic point to me is that, um, you know, thinking about how to train sci uh, scientists to give a presentation is one thing, but for people who really want this to be a bigger part of their work, they need introductions to the network, right? So uh, a researcher is not going to have the same professional network. That's just a fact, right? Like that's, that's <laughs> um, when we think about just scientific training in general, right? You're training to people to become researchers and you integrate them into your network. Like how, how are people supposed to become and find these, these careers if they aren't ever introduced to anybody who does them? So again, I don't totally know what the model is, but I really think we need practitioner training tracks within sciences for science communication. 
that's my solution. And I know it's not an easy one and I know it's not something everybody can undertake, but it's the one that I, that I believe in. Right. We have time for one more question. Um, Sarah Brock asks, uh, how do you think performative activism within virtual communities such as Heartstrings posts commonly seen on social media helps spread or detracts from scientific communication that impacts the real world communities or ecologies? Um, okay, so we're talking, let me see if I can find this one. Thank you. Uh, performative it's activism. The very bottom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot, right? I mean, there, there's the performative. I'm not a big fan of performative anything. I mean, I know that it has its place, but really what I'm, you know, again, arguing for in the book is that we sort of drop the performative side and the, the performance of, of the whole thing and, and think more relationally. Um, and so in, in terms of um, thinking about the reality of science communication work, the, the biggest disjoint that I see, and this may not um, necessarily resonate, but is, is that the actual work is not nearly as glamorous <laughs> as, as a lot of folks sort of, uh, you know, make it seem in terms of that performative piece that particularly takes place on social media. And so I find that, that there's a real disjuncture between what the actual work, day-to-day -day work of a science communicator is and what people's sense of it is. And so I, I worry a little bit that there's a little bit of a collision course around, um, around <clears throat> what the reality of those professional jobs might look like, um, because it is often very much behind the scenes. Um, my work for the most part is to elevate other people's work. <laughs> uh, that's basically what I do for a living is try to stay behind the scenes. Although um, at this point in my career, I, I do a hybrid of both. But for most of my career, it was to support other people's work. And so um, I think you could end up with a bunch of people who feel very unseen and invisible in the work if they don't understand what the day-to-day -day of it really looks like. Um, and certainly in terms of how it affects communities, which is a whole other, a whole other ball of wax. Well, we are out of time, Faith. I wanna take this moment again, uh, have everybody join me in thanking you uh, for a wonderful seminar. We really appreciate your insights. And I, I see some virtual clapping all over. So that's okay. great. Uh, I'm again, sorry for people whose, whose questions I didn't get to. Um, I hope, Elaine, we can maybe download those from the chat. <laughs> um, I would love to see the suite of questions. But yeah, sorry to everyone who we didn't get to those, but feel free to reach out to me. Thanks again, Faith. And just, just a plug, we'll be seeing Faith again in Greenville. She'll be doing a workshop at our annual UCOWER NIWAR conference, June 14th through the 16th in person. So uh, we look forward to that. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Faith. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Bye. day. Bye.